Well, I guess um, let's go ahead and start so that you can go to your class sometime. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. This is our first round bag of the semester, and also our new arrangement. Uh, if you haven't been here, we have a new screen. Um, I want to um, big thanks to Nicole McGrath who coordinated this event and to our presenters. Um, our first presenter today is Yan Tao Huang. He is a GRA for Dr. Cockleman. So take it away. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm uh, Yan Tao, and this is the work I work with um, Dr. Cockleman and Neil. It's about uh, to, uh, to anticipate the impact of uh, self-driving vehicles on the uh, Texas Triangle Mega Region. And it, it now this work contains both the passenger vehicles and the uh, freight, the trucks, uh, freight vehicles. And the background for this is we, ha we now have like uh, merging techniques of the automation and we want to see how this like uh, the passenger vehicles, trucks, and other like uh, types uh, of vehicles can be uh, can benefit from this technology, and um, we want to see how these uh, vehicles may shift uh, passenger and uh, freight travel pattern over time. And the uh, like background of Texas uh, Triangle Mega Region, it, ha it it is one of the nation's eleven mega regions. It contains uh, 18 million of Texas, 25 million residents, and it, it also has about 6% of the U.S. population and generated uh, seven, about 7% 7 of U.S. GDP in, in 2010. We want to uh, use the uh, statewide analysis model data to uh, incorporate the new travel uh, modes in it and see how the model responds. First, first, it's about the statewide analysis model data. It has uh, the mega region contains uh, more than two thousand link, uh, two thousand TDs of the states, which has uh, more than four thousand TDs, and it has sixty six of the states, uh, two hundred fifty four counties. It has uh, like about. 20,000 nodes and 20, 28,000 links of the uh, network, which which uh, lies uh, partially or entirely within the mega region, and I think the like it has the um, links of the whole U.S., but like only a part of them like uh, lies in the mega region, and it includes um, 26,000 roadway links, and the. Uh, Travel demand, the travel demand is the Texas, is the statewide uh, demand, and the uh, uh, network is the U.S. network, and the results were pulled out from the, uh, like the demand results from the Texas. We used a four-step travel demand model with feedback loop. It's a traditional travel demand model. We built a base case without autonomous vehicles, uh, shared autonomous vehicles and autonomous trucks mode, and then we add them in to compare against <coughs> to compare against the base case. And we also did uh, a various uh, parameter assumptions and the uh, sensitivity analysis, and we we didn't. Uh, do the different time of day for the analysis. We only use 24-hour simulation to uh, consider the like the trips traveling across Texas. They they will not finish like in two or three hours. They may they takes longer. So now uh, I want to like briefly talk about what we did for each stage of the traditional travel demand model. The first is the trip generation. Um, we obtain the trip generation rates from the same model, and and it was built uh, based on the two, uh, 20, uh, 2009 NHTS data. And we assume that there is a 15 
increase for both uh, chip generation and uh, for both production and attraction, recognizing that we have like uh, the elderly people, disabled people who have access to the autonomous vehicles after like the after the technologies have like uh, applied have been applied to the market. And all the trip purposes are aggregated. We didn't consider different trip purposes. For trip distribution, we replaced the traditional uh, trip distribution procedure by a larger destination choice model. In this case, we want to see how the destination shifts uh, after the, uh, the after the autonomous vehicle closer is introduced. And uh, each destination, the traction of each destination depends on the log sum of the mode choice and the population at the destinations. And for and uh, and for that uh, four step demand model, we have the same for both passenger and freight. And for freight, we still use the doubly constrained uh, trip uh, distribution procedure. Which, which is uh, like we apply the same uh, parameters from the uh, statewide analysis model. And we, we did uh, like a change to the mode choice. We added the new mode nested under the mode we are interested, we are interested in. We have uh, human driven vehicles, bus, rail, and air for passenger and we have truck, rail, and the intermodal for freight. And this, uh, this mode uh, already exists in statewide analysis model, and the, ori the, the base case, the parameter of the base case will apply directly from the uh, same model, and we adjust the, and we kind of like simplify the procedure of the four step model to build our own, and we adjust some of the parameters to like fit the uh, uh, fit the the model to to mimic the same pattern from the uh, statewide analysis model. And the last is the uh, traffic assignment and feedback procedure. Mm, we use the same. Uh, vehicle occupancies for human-driven vehicle, autonomous vehicle, and shared autonomous vehicles. Um, like 1.5 uh, vehicle occupancy is is for human-driven vehicle and like autonomous vehicle, which is very common. And and we also use shared autonomous, for shared autonomous vehicles because um, there are more, uh, Usually, more uh, vehicle occupancies in shared autonomous vehicle, but we also have empty uh, vehicles because they need to traveling uh, uh, like in the city network to pick up and drop off passengers. And the free trip table uh, was uh, converted to trucks and real cars based on the average weights that that has been used in uh, statewide analysis model. And uh, the last, the assignment is conducted on the whole U.S. network, which means that um, <coughs> the the vehicles like traveling from uh, like one TAD in Texas to another TAD in Texas, they can go across other states to avoid congestion. And and we don't consider the uh, network from the uh, Mexico. So we don't have, like, vehicles cannot go across US and Mexico board. And here are the results. Uh, we have for, like, generate a similar pattern that we already have in statewide analysis model. So we can, like, apply the um, autonomous, autonomous vehicles in it. We have uh, high correlations, but we only did the like the trip distributions, and we check this to like, compare the base case we have and the uh, uh, results from the uh, statewide analysis model. And here is the results after we have the um, automation technology in our mode. 
and we assume that the operating cost for human-driven vehicle is uh, 0.6 dollar per mile. For a for autonomous vehicle is 0.8 uh, dollar per mile and one dollar per mile for sure autonomous vehicles. And the graph shows the distance or uh, show the difference uh, before and after the autonomous vehicles. You can see that the uh, the blue line is the uh, the sum of the human driven vehicle and like all the passenger cars mode, private passenger cars mode. And we can see the uh, increase, the big increase uh, for trip distance less than five miles and the increase, the amount of increase decreases um, with the increase of the uh, travel distance. And we can also see the uh, decreasing bus and rail. <coughs> for a uh, short distance, which is less than 50 miles, uh, we don't have like uh, we don't we don't have air travel. And for the graph on the right, we have air travel. Like between, we have the decrease in the air travel between 100 miles and. Uh, 200 and like uh, 70 miles <coughs> and uh, the biggest decrease happens in the like one uh, hundred and fifty miles which I think is about the uh, Austin to to Dallas I think is that uh, no uh, yeah 200 miles Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's it's about like the commuting distance between the big cities, and we aggregate the uh, results for the trip distance for different modes. We saw the um, <coughs> a small um, impact on shorter distances, but they they have like they have the a bigger value for that, but they have like a um, less percentage for uh, shorter di shorter <coughs> distance trips, and they have like bigger impact on long distance trips. And we have a huge decrease in bus, rail, and air. And the air, like what I want to mention here, the air, the, it, it has like uh, more than 80% decrease, but I check the like the the, uh, the like the air trips happen in uh, Texas. The like for trips that originate and both originate and uh, the end like stop in Texas. I mean the trips with uh, origins with origins and destinations both in Texas. They only account for uh, five percent of the total trips that happen in Texas. It has like uh, more uh, about 95 percent of the air trips that will go uh, to other states or from other uh, other states to Texas. So it only kind of the connecting trip for the air, which might like largely shift to the autonomous vehicles. And also we have the results for freight. We apply the same parameters from the statewide analysis mode and the same travel mode, and we just like throw it in and see how the <coughs> changes would be. We uh, because uh, autonomous trucks can run uh, 24 uh, seven, and we assume that there is a decrease in the like travel time for them because the drive the. Um, drivers do not have to to uh, keep driving all the time. They can rest in the vehicle, and they only need to uh, like take care of like the load of the freight or something else. And we assume there is an increase in truck costs. Consider the um, like the initial cost in introducing the uh, automation technology, and also. Um, like some other costs, like uh, like uh, training the 
drivers to be familiar with like the autonom autonomous vehicle settings and we we have like a 20% increase in cost so here are the re results for uh, for the settings i just mentioned we have um, like seven types of mode that uh, commodities that have increase of more than 5% and we have a uh, decrease for all the modes for real and intermodal travel. Uh, here are the distributions. We have an um, after, yeah, it, it's kind of the, we have the aggregated uh, results for this and we can see that the after the uh, automation technology is introduced we have uh, more uh, trips for uh, longer distance and shorter and actually we have more after like five percent uh, five uh, miles of distance and because and also for the freight we have shorter uh, travel time but uh, higher cost we kind of have the similar pattern for um, scenarios, both uh, for scenari scenarios before and after the automation technology. And here are the VMT results, which is <coughs> quite the same. The like the the trend is quite the same as the trips we we had just now, and but we can see a lot more uh, VMT increase in the. Uh, across the regions for like for all these big cities we have <coughs> and especially for Austin it will have like more than 50% of, of the total and like a part of this is like directly from the uh, assumption that we have 15% of generation across the region and uh, some, of, some of like other um, assumptions of uh, cost will impact these results. And I'll skip, like, because of the time, skip, skip this. Uh, here just we show that, like, the different patterns, like we had for the truck uh, commodities that has a in uh, trip increase <coughs> of more than 5%, for different, uh, mo mostly we can see that it, like, it's the connection between the uh, big cities here in the Texas. And we also have the uh, network congestion results. Pre previously, we have 5% um, of all the links that have uh, volume uh, capacity ratio uh, over one. And now we have, uh, like, we now almost double for the congested links. The last is um, we also have, like, autonomous vehicle sensitivity analysis. We checked uh, different values of how autonomous vehicles like can reduce the value of travel time because people can like do different kind of stuff on board like uh, sleeping or walking. And we also check different operating costs for uh, different uh, vehicle settings. And we also uh, tested the uh, nested coefficients of uh, the automobile mode, which shows like uh, we test we tested different correlations like how uh, autonomous vehicles and uh, can uh, substitute the uh, human driven vehicle or shared autonomous vehicles so here are the key results we have uh, <coughs> average trip distance uh, versus um, by 14 percent and from um, uh, 14 to 16 miles we have uh, local air travel fall by over 80 percent. We have um, we have the VMT on average pre predicted to uh, rise 47 uh, percent, and uh, uh, congested links are predicted to double in the future. And we have seven or 15 uh, mode classes that that have a uh, increase by uh, more than five percent. So in the future, we will have um, well, it's. It's difficult to, I think it's quite difficult to implement most of this, but there are the potential to like uh, extend this uh, research. 
like the dynamics of uh, congestion, and we consider the uh, like the mechanism of the shared autonomous vehicles of so pick up and drop off. We can adjust the like uh, uh, the uh, alternative specific constants in the model to to like and we can check this also from some new tra travel survey we can obtain and we could allow the trips uh, across the US Mexico border and yeah so that's most of it thank you <laughs> Any questions <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Uh, in the congestion simulation model, it shows after autonomous driving vehicle equipment, the congestion actually increased from 5% to 10%. Yeah. From 5 yeah. To 10%, right? Yeah. So, that's bad. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, I yeah, I have like talked to some people like during my TRV meeting and yeah, I think most of them told me that they think it will like the autonomous vehicle will like alleviate the congestion because there are like a uh, larger capacity on road. Like people are uh, the vehicles are connected like more more connected in the future, so to increase the capacity. But yeah, we we didn't like we didn't uh, make the corresponding changes to the network. Like we allow like more capacities and faster speed on road. We just keep it like the same as what it is now. <coughs> Do you think if we allow more? Yeah, yeah. It it could it could be like better in terms of congestion, but I I, I think the um, the travel demand increase at the beginning like should should be cause more congestion than what what we will like. But this uh, I think an interesting question here. That if you use a VC ratio as a measure, which may not. Uh, show or demonstrate the potential value of uh, AV because uh, and congestion uh, of more vehicles mm -hmm. over capacity but not necessarily slower um, speed because they're fully uh, uh, connected you could have uh, more volumes over the capacity but they're moving at the same speed for example without congestion order uh, or a prior level, could that scenario happen? Like because um, so yeah, many, so many vehicles so in the pa in the old uh, way of measuring when you have uh, high volume over capacity, then certainly there is a uh, there is an equation equivalent to the slower movement. Then that's congestion. And then now you're moving, you're all moving. Yeah, moving as a, as a platoon. Yeah. So I think uh, if you show the operating speed, the model speed as well, and that could tell a, full, a better picture than just a VC ratio. Yeah, I, um, yeah, the static traffic assignments, this volume is actually the, the demand. If the, like, the demand, the demand mm -hmm. is greater than the capacity, which means that it is, right. there is already congestion on the road. Right. I so think that uh, my my question uh, different. I think uh, in terms of understanding the potential uh, AV impacts mm -hmm. here. Uh, in this case, you do not know. You cannot tell exactly whether or not uh, the results uh, are attributable to AV technology or to the 15% uh, increase, hypothetical increase in troop demand. Yeah. So uh, uh, for the sake of analysis, maybe worth looking into the scenario, just AV, and then assuming zero increase in the uh, troop generation. You do that in, sep in two separate steps. Yeah, yeah. And then okay. you see whether or not AV adoption could lead to some kind of uh, like a behavior change 
and reflected by the uh, VC ratio, VMT, or model share. And then you do another step. Well, uh, AV, we know, we expect that may uh, induce some kind of a, a latent demand, induce a demand, and then uh, and do this <coughs> second step. Then you can tell. Right now, we, c we cannot tell. Yeah. <laughs> Even without AV, you, you impose a 15% uh, troop rate, additional troop rate. So you, mm -hmm. of course, you get uh, congestion or, or yeah. other. So that's one, one question. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another one, why air and the real mo model shares decline so much with a AV introduction? That sounds a little bit mysterious here. And I, yeah, we I just could not see from your analysis kind of a, uh, explaining the link between the air de decline and then the uh, yeah, wouldn't air, air would serve a separate market, like in my mind. Yeah. <coughs> it may come yeah. may be caused by your internal model setup rather than by the reality. I mean that intuitively made sense to me. I mean, you know, it's like this, rather than drive to Austin's airport, get on a plane, a, a quick, you know, go through security, hop, hop on a, you know, 45 minute flight to Houston, get from the airport to somewhere else, you get in your, in your wonderful AV uh, car, and then you just read your phone for three hours, and then it takes you straight to your destination. I, because it cuts out the travel time to the airport from your origin and from the end destination, like from the ending airport to the yeah, destination yeah. too. So. Well, eighty percent, uh, almost like a taking the <laughs> taking the air market by eighty percent. That sounds uh, too good to be true. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I guess to get that, I would imagine you'd have to have seamless transfers, right? So in other words, someone's <laughs> flying to Austin from you know, New York, but they fly through Houston, and then I would assume that means that there's, you know, they get off their plane, they immediately get into a waiting AV that takes them the last leg of their trip. Well, I, yeah, I guess the interest here is not necessarily uh, what percentage, is 80% or 40% or 30%, it's how you look at the interaction between the uh, air travel, mm -hmm. rail, and AV, the model, the model, uh, more choice behavior for the long distance travel. I think that it's more interesting than just, but this number just, uh, yeah, that's a yeah just uh, kind of a, uh, I would love to have that. I'd love to see that, <laughs> if that's the case, but just kind of too good to be true. But that's local ones. Yeah, they, 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 these are just local. These are only triangle no, the triangle to triangle. Yeah. I know, the trips before, uh, before, right, uh, greater than 50 miles, that's like an inter, uh, intercity travel, intermetro travel, right? Yeah. If you look at it, uh, do you have, anyway, uh, well, I guess I'll uh, uh, chance to other people to ask questions. I, I was curious, are, are you assuming that bus travel looks the same then that it looks now, or are you assuming that buses are automated by then too? Because it, it's it, a same. It's same. same as it is now. Yeah, because yeah, it, it might be worth looking at, I don't know how you plug this into the model, but if, if cars are automated, I'm sure buses will be automated too, which would mean that bus service will be way more frequent, you know, than it is now. You'll have just yeah. eliminated the biggest obstacle labor to right, increasing right, yeah. bus service. You know, which is not to say that AVs may still decimate bus travel, but it's it's maybe worth testing it under kind of a. But the, I I guess that this model uh, cannot capture that in the sense because does not have a labor cost uh, in the if you consider bus cost on the cost to you to riders, you need to somehow transform that reducing the uh, driver's cost, labor cost. Well, and I guess I don't really have a sense of how the mode yeah, choice right. model works, but maybe yeah. I would assume it would change your calculation about which mode you take if mm. the bus service, you expect to have a much lower average waiting time for a bus than you do now. Right, right. Yeah. Or, or just uh, treat AV as bus, or treat bus as AV. Instead of just a, uh, AV, right, means, uh, Oh, of course, it has an uh, individual personal cost. Yeah, we like can a, reflect uh, like 
80 cents per mile, uh, your assumption for bus, and the assumption for that. Yeah, the key assumption for uh, automobile is the re reduction of value of travel time. So, like for bus, it it won't be like that much because the passengers are like the same on the bus, whether or not the bus are automated. Yeah, no, I think the dramatic change is, is the is the frequency of service that you can offer. Yeah, yeah, bus. yeah. That should be a so the, you know one, so yeah. the bus coming once an hour it comes four times an hour maybe with no increase in cost to the transit provider to do that. Well, yeah. in this case, what you you did have this uh, strong assumption about oper operating speed of AV, right? Before you calculate the travel time. <coughs> Or just cost? Ju just cost. We don't have it's the... Just cost. Yeah. How come? How come you can have such a dramatic uh, model split impact? If it just cost, it only shows in the... Um, because the, the value of travel time is reflected by the utilities of choosing the modes. Like... Uh, okay, and then the time? Time is the model... model time, time, is the, time is the same. Time is the same for... Autonomous vehicle and human driven vehicle. Well, I guess in that case, then uh, it's really important to see this and uh, no degenerate uh, scenario of having no increase in trip generation. In that case, uh, we may see, my hunch, we may, you may see uh, AV and, and car together decline uh, decline the share because higher cost. That's natural. Yeah. They must have something to show the AV superior in terms of a uh, time uh, time cost than the conventional car. Otherwise, how come you can see decline what was increased cost? Well, it's almost like you're, if you're choosing between a conventional car and an AV, you're being compensated by how much you value your time, right? Because all of a sudden, instead of wasting your time driving, you get your time back to do something productive in the car, yeah. like you know, right. like read. Um, you know, it's true. Yeah, and then you have to make an assumption about it. On your phone. Yeah, you have to make an assumption about it and something related to time. Yeah. And yeah. The value of time or operating time, uh, operating speed. Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I added added to the value of time. Oh, here we go. Then that's a big Yeah, the cost increased, but yeah, yeah, I mentioned. Yeah, I should mention it at the beginning. Yeah. Oh, great. Um, excellent questions. Thank you again, Yang Tao, for presenting for us. Let's give him a round of applause. And um, now we're going to transition to our second presenter. Our second presenter for today is Chris Vichchak. He is a graduate uh, GRA for Dr. Jonathan Zhao. Um, also, while Chris is setting up, um, he was the recipient of UGC uh, Outstanding Student of the Year Award. Um, that was selected for our center. Um, there were applicants from all four of our partners, um, LSU, TSU, University of Pennsylvania, uh, and our university, and Chris was selected. So uh, we look forward to hearing what you've been working on. Okay, yeah, thank you for that introduction. Um, so this is basically based on a, a sur some survey work that myself and Professor Zhao did last semester, and we're kind of analyzing it now. So it's so the background basically is we wanted to investigate um, like transportation networking companies, and not so much like uh, like what impact they're having on the taxi market or anything like that. We wanted to just investigate more like why people are using them as opposed to just taking a bus or a taxi or something like that and how people are kind of valuing these services. And so just some background, like most of you guys have used these, the transportation networking companies. Uh, the three largest ones right now are Uber, Lyft, and Didi. Uber is the largest. It has a valuation of about 120 billion. Didi is the second largest with about an 80 billion uh, USD valuation. And then Lyft is much smaller than either of those and uh, maybe only half that value or less. And so Uber and Lyft dominate the American and European and South American markets. And then Didi is the dominant player in the Chinese market, parts of South America, and now they're expanding into Australia. 
Um, so our research questions was really how are TNCs being used in the Texas Triangle? Why are people choosing TNCs over other travel options that you might think they could choose like a conventional taxi or a bus? And then are TNC enhancing mobility for Texas citizens? And so we did a survey and we did two surveys. So this one is based on a panel survey we did using a Question Pro platform. And we obtained 1,000 complete responses, 250 each from, oops, from each of the uh, metro areas in the four largest metro areas in Texas, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, and Dallas. So the respondents had to live inside the MSA for each of those cities to respond. And then we had 991 valid responses. And we also conducted a supplemental snowball survey. So that was just sent out to people at UT and our friends and family. And so this one is just based on the panel survey, not the supplemental. We haven't added that data in yet. And so these are the results. So this is who we got. Uh, so these are kind of the age of the respondents. You can see it skews a little older. Um, but it's a fairly even age distribution overall. Um, it was overwhelmingly female, which was interesting, but I think that has more to do with how the, like who takes the panel surveys and who the panel survey company has signed up to take their surveys when they send them out. Um, ethnicity, it was pretty white, but we had a fairly good mix um, overall. Um, so this is actually fairly representative of like the demographics in Texas, although this maybe should be somewhat higher, but it wasn't too bad. And then income and education, we had uh, sort of mostly people on the lower income, lower side of the income bracket. And again, I think that has more to do with who's taking these panel surveys they get paid for taking the panel survey, so it's kind of people probably trying to look up, to pick up a little extra income. And then education, most people were kind of in this sort of, uh, some college to bachelor's degree range. Um, and that's, this actually basically matches pretty well the education distribution in the general population. And then vehicle access, this was surprising. Overwhelmingly, the people who took our survey have regular vehicle access. So one thing I didn't mention at the beginning is that you had to have used a TNC to take this survey. So this is only for TNC users. And so overwhelmingly, the people have regular vehicle access. And then frequency of use, most people are using them very infrequently. 42% of respondents use them less than once a month. And you know, well over half of people are using them less than a few times a month. Uh, the most frequent day of the week is non-work days. And then, you know, some people are using them on work days. The length of trip, again, this is pretty consistent with prior research. Most people are using them for relatively short duration trips, no more than 20 minutes for the vast majority of respondents. And then the time of day they're using, you can see here, these are early evening and evening, and then night. So this was kind of a choose anyone that applies question, uh, but well over half of, or nearly half of respondents said they use them in the evening. Um, and so most people are skewing towards that nighttime usage. And then the trip purpose, again, this was choose anyone that applies. Overwhelmingly, people are using them to go to bars and restaurants. <laughs> um, and then, you know, some commuting use, but most of these uses are much less so then we looked at kind of why people are using them. And again, overwhelmingly, people are choosing convenience as their main motivating factor. The cost, which is surprising, is not that motivating to people. And then, you know, travel time as well is not that motivating. Although I actually think this question was somewhat poorly written uh, because I think there may have been some confusion between travel time and convenience. People were kind of lumping those together. Um, and then we asked them to compare to public transport and conventional taxis, which we kind of thought were the two modes that we'd be competing with TNCs. And again, overwhelmingly, most people thought that 
uh, TNCs are far more convenient than public transport. And most people thought they were more convenient than conventional taxis and also less expensive, which is, um, I think that's actually just more of a perception. They're not less expensive than conventional taxis in many cases, but <coughs> the companies have done a successful job of selling themselves as cheaper than a regular taxi. Um, and then we asked, do they connect to multimodal transportation services? And so most people are not using them to connect to multi to another transportation service. Uh, but for those who do, it's mostly to go to the airport and sometimes like a bus or their parked personal vehicle. Uh, rail, much less, but that's probably because there's very little rail in Texas. And then like a bike or other is a very small percentage. And then we asked people, like, do they believe that the TNCs are kind of increasing their access and mobility in urban areas? And most people thought they believed that they were making more trips because they had access to a TNC. And uh, well over half of people said they helped them get more places that they would not otherwise be able to go. And so then, this is kind of what I'm doing right now. I'm trying to segment out the results by uh, like men and women, and then also by income. And then finally, we're gonna do kind of the heavy users versus the lighter users. And so right now, I've done it by uh, men and women. And so we see that men are appearing to use TNCs with a higher frequency than women. Women appear to be slightly more motivated by convenience, and there doesn't appear to be any difference in the length of trips. So the bottom line conclusions, uh, which are basically consistent with what other people have found is that, you know, TNCs are not really changing people's daily travel patterns at a fundamental level. They're mostly just being used for uh, leisure trips at night to go to entertainment mm -hmm. venues. And so they're probably just replacing taxis, like for all the hype about people selling their cars or this or that. Uh, it doesn't really appear from our results that anyone's saying, wow, I have Uber and Lyft now, let me just like sell my personal vehicle and take a TNC all the time. And then our further research, we just want to further analyze this data and possibly do another type of survey on other shared mobility services like e-scooters or bike sharing and so on and so forth. So yeah, that's my presentation. Question for the audience. Did anybody participate in the survey? Oh, I want to participate. It's a biased survey. I took it, so it's really interesting to see the results. Good job. But in the, uh, in the very interesting question you asked, uh, your comment on, uh, in your questionnaire, uh, I don't remember you have a question asking people whether or not. You are taking more bus or less uh, after uh, using TNC. You're you're having you're occupying only more or less cars after you uh, TNC becomes uh, available. Or you so does this uh, survey does survey answer the question about the model substitute? No, we didn't ask if they were substituting. Then you you should watch out your comments because later you said, oh, we did not uh, did not find that people are kind of only less car or more car because the survey did not provide that information for you to. Yeah, to yeah. I mean, not directly. Right. No. Yeah. That's that's uh, kind of like a, a your your hunch. Yeah. And that yeah. needs to be verified probably in the later in the future survey mm -hmm. because you did not ask for the model. Substitution, uh, particularly people are concerned that uh, with TNC uh, transit ridership uh, become a decline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. De and that might be the case, but we need data to verify that. So it's actually competing for market uh, with, uh, with bus buses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The research is kind of mixed on that right now. Uh, uh, I don't. Know, I got it wrong. Your bar chart shows that women are more likely to use than men, right? The, that was just we had more women responding. Oh, resp oh, that's a response. Right? Yeah, yeah. So this this was just a panel survey. So it was just a company that asked like their people. Are, they, are these participants? Yeah, yeah. The participants survey. were more female than male. 
So and then the, your your results showing that uh, men are more likely to use TNC than women. Uh, so they're not more likely to use them. They just appear to use them at a higher frequency. So women skew more towards one time a month or l like oh, I two see. to three times a month or okay. less, and men appear to be more like once a week, you know. So that's kind of the initial oh. result. Sorry, then I got confused. Yeah. Did you ask anything about perceived safety? I can't remember if you asked about safety. So there is one question in here. We asked, like, oh, I didn't actually put it in there. There was one that question that asked, what do you value? And safety was kind of up there. But most people appear to be motivated by convenience as opposed to uh, about 20% of people seem to be primarily motivated by safety. So I can see like perceived safety being why women would use it less frequently. Yeah, I'm not. It's it's hard to say yeah. why that would be the case. The, the first thing that came to mind for me is women are probably more likely to take trips with children than men are. That's true. And, uh, yeah. You know, you could probably find some literature on that that, and you can sort of see what that delta is and sort of see how that lines up with the delta you see in your yeah. results. I also have a suspicion that <coughs> men may be more likely to use them for business purposes and like get reimbursed by their company. So that may you may see more like business travelers on the male side of the equation. Or for non-business travel, men are more likely to drink. So they yeah, also, yeah, more. yeah. <laughs> yeah <that's laughs> because you show that a uh, high percentage are going to the <laughs> bars. <laughs> So this cross tabulation results may may tell more interesting story. Well, then we can be thankful for that. You <laughs> <laughs> eyes, <All> right? <laughs> well, this is uh, more than nine hundred, almost one uh, nine hundred uh, responses. Uh, all came from the triangle. Yeah, all from the Texas oh, triangle. Yeah. Yeah, probably the first survey that we had right? for the triangle area. And but that survey, uh, you think. You can uh, promote that uh, survey for the in anywhere, right, in the U.S.? That's a snowball survey. So we, we had two surveys. One was the snowball survey, and one was the panel survey that we paid for. Okay. And this is just the panel survey data. And then the snowball survey had about 320 responses. And Do you think the results will pretty much be the same? Uh, so, so that one had a, just a very different demographic. It was overwhelmingly students and, like, um, like people that we just knew who had like <coughs> were way way skewed towards the higher end of the education scale too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> um. it'd be interesting to see how that one. Because I saw a study recently that uh, was it UC Berkeley that there's now like eleven thousand trips that are being done by TNCs for students just to get to class, yeah. so they don't have to bike or take the bus. That's going to be interesting to see if that one like was similar for like the UT area. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if that, that study was done before or after the scooter explosion. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just you said that there is enough, but I was curious what you said about costs that uh, TNCs actually don't cost any less than taxes. Because mm -hmm. yeah, I just what I've read is that no one's making any money on TNCs yet. Yeah, that's, just, I mean, that's so if they're going to continue, presumably at some point they're going to have to up how much they're charging. Yeah, so, so it's been going up gradually, and that's why they're, they've become comparable to taxis in most areas now, because for a long, long time the TNCs were willing to just bleed money and give, like the way it would work is you would pay four dollars for your ride or whatever but the TNC would make sure that the driver made ten dollars on that ride and gradually they've been scaling back on the basically supplementing people and I costs. think squeezing the drivers more too right which, right which right presumably so they can only get away with for you know you can only push that so far before you lose all your drivers. yeah yeah so they're so not making money means that companies do not make money but the drivers are still have some kind of a financial benefits, otherwise they will not participate in the Yeah, it's just 
th that was just purely anecdotal, but every TNC, I always have the same conversation with every TNC driver I ever have, which is not that many, but they, you know, I, I, the consistent theme is like, it was really great to drive for Uber and Lyft a few years ago, and it's becoming kind of less and less attractive because they just feel more, they're just not getting as, it's not as worth it for them to pick up a turn on the app. Yeah, because of the, kind of the, the, the margin too small. Yeah, yeah. yeah. New York City, the city that's trying to get minimum wage for all oh, TNC drivers. Yeah. It's one city's proposing so, it. So they didn't do minimum wage. New York City just capped the number of drivers. Oh, so that, okay. that guarantees a certain oh. interior. TNC, yeah. TNCs are not necessarily uh, like jobless people, right? You could start a TNC. Yeah. I could start. Yeah. But I think they were saying that they there's a, one city, I think, that's trying to put a proposal that the the TNCs have to pay their drivers minimum wage, like or guarantee them that they make minimum wage per hour. Um, so I don't know how they're planning on doing that. Okay. Huh. Didn't want, I don't know. None of us participate in that. If we, if we participate in that services, do we have to kind of uh, disclose our job or any current income or whatever other details? I, no. I, I think I uh, read uh, you have to submit your like, uh, uh, insurance, take a photo ID, like take a photo against the war, and also they will do a background check yeah. for the both. Uh, but that's for safety concern. Yes, that's mostly. for safety concern. Yeah, although when Austin wanted to do fingerprinting, that was one of the issues that led Lyft and Uber to um, pull out of the city, out of Austin for a while. But it's, it's also becoming like more professionalized, the driver market, because because they're making less money now. Right. So it's harder for people to just pick it up for like 10 hours a week and make it worth their time. Like, so that is, it's not just so only income. Right? People may, may do that for uh, kind of a, as a second source of income. Or by well, extreme case, the, uh, in the, Chinese market, market, I heard uh, some people, I think that again, uh, in the evening, very late, very, very rich people, fancy, driving fancy cars to go and pick up people from airport, others, and then the passengers kind of uh, wonder, so, you are not really such a fancy Mercedes uh, BMW uh, SUV, is <laughs> more, than, more than a million uh, yuan a piece. Why you are you needing this money for income? No. Uh, I'm bored. I just uh, want to have some fun. Right? <laughs> Get away chatting, from family. Right, chatting with chatting with uh, chatting with the strangers. <laughs> some kind of new stories. <laughs> Interesting kind of a lifestyle. My sense is a lot of the TNC drivers here will just they'll be on multiple apps and then yeah. they'll just turn them on and yeah, off at yeah, different yeah. times depending on what they think is the most advantageous. Uh, well, maybe we should do that. What? Jimbo, you can start a program, an app, so we all uh, buy, and then we, just, we participate in TNC, and, and then you can uh, get responses from the service uh, provider's perspective. Right? We were, we were, we were. <laughs> Only if you pay minimum wage. Yeah. <laughs> or oh, when they get some extra income, that would be nice. We were thinking to have a second survey for the drivers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Any other questions? Right at time. Great. Yeah, I think we're right at time. All right. Thank you. All right, Chris.